Oh. Okay. So let me make a comment, uh, two comments about the parallelism. I will close the door when it comes back. Um, so on your papers that I just gave back to you, I marked your parallelism the way I want you to mark it. So some of you wrote a P in the sentence. I put it in the margin. It, it's easier for me to find. Um, like Zachary, you made yours red, so that's easy to find. But you don't need to underline because we're gonna at the end of the year we're gonna have like five or six things, and it's gonna get very busy. And I'm gonna be looking all over your paper. So I, if if you say, oh, but I marked my parallelism, Mrs. Ferguson. Yes, but you didn't mark it in the margin the way I asked you to. So if there's a P in the margin, that's why I'm showing you how to mark it, Jonathan. Okay, the second. I'm I cannot hear you guys in here. All right, say again, Jonathan. There is a comma and oh, okay. Can I read the sentence again? Because sometimes I am not totally sure if something is a okay. So again, tell me, are we looking at this comma right here? No, this comma. Wait, no, that, that, this comma. That right comma. Here. It oh, is. okay. Um, can I start at the beginning of the sentence? Their sword clashed, clanged, and boomed in the night. Okay. Soon the emperor won. Oh, do you know what? I thought this was the beginning of the next sentence. Finding the knight to be a famous robber, they then teamed up. But you meant it to be a part of this. So I apologize for that. I misread where you wanted to put that. So that's on me. Okay. Oren, yes, sir. You, had a, you have six things to ask? No. Oh, oh, I don't know. Five, maybe not, maybe that not that many, but at least four or five. Hey, Oren. Okay, I would like to, with Hans's permission, I would like to read something that Hans wrote that is three clauses, but it's not parallelism. And I want to explain to you why. And then I'm going to transform it into a legit one. Okay, and you're good with this. You don't mind. It's a perfectly, by the way, what he wrote is a perfectly grammatically correct sentence. There's nothing wrong with the sentence that he wrote. Okay, here we go. When they got inside, I think that's one clause, by breaking a hole into his house's walls, they heard the count reassuring his wife that his plot to kill the king tomorrow will succeed. And then you proceed with a conversation. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. So, <clears throat> I, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think you were thinking I have three clauses, boom. But the thing, the trick about this that makes them sound nice is we all the time use three clauses, but we don't use them in parallel. So parallel means they're all the same. So if you think about what um, Hans wrote, when they got inside, we would call that an adverbial dependent clause, right? It tells when. By breaking a hole into the house's walls. Breaking a hole into the house's walls is a noun clause now. It's the ob object of the preposition by. Then they heard the count reassuring his wife. This is just an independent clause sentence. So to, to parallel them, to make them the same, we could do this. Um, they went inside broke a hole in the house's walls and began listening to the count talking to his wife. Do you see? And then I'm telling three things they did. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, so three random clause that aren't the same kind of clause doesn't really make a parallelism, but three that are doing the same thing. Telling three things they're telling when it happened or how it happened or that it happened. All right, here, would you just, so I don't have to go around, would you pass that down to Hans? Okay. Um, did I write anything other than Jonathan had a, a, a question about a comma that I misunderstood? Does anybody else have a question about the paper I just gave back to you? Yes, sir. You don't think so. You look a little tired today, Nathan. You're very relaxed looking. Is this because you were just playing basketball or? No, I stayed up till 10. I stayed up till 10. Well, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. I'm really tired, too, because I laid awake for two hours in the middle of the night, not able to sleep. So we can all be tired together. But hey, 
maybe King Alfred the Great and Canute and the Battle of Hastings will wake us up because it's really exciting. Um, yes. Why should there be a comma at the end of the sentence? Oh, um, Oh, because um, this belongs here. Egridge said with lots of pomp in his voice. That that actually belongs here. Therefore, placing me on the throne tomorrow as monarch, Egridge said with lots of pomp in his voice. Okay. So I was saying that belongs here, and then you would put a comma after it. Okay. Does that make sense? I think it just accidentally got, like, you hit tab or something, and it went to the next line or hit enter. You know what? Okay. It's okay. Parents aren't perfect. Oh, Oren, do you have a question? Oh, yeah, because, wow, to make it parallel, you need another verb. Um, what you did, can I, can, can you read it again? Read it again. Everybody, Listen to what Oren's going to read. Read it again, Oren. Egric, wait, do you want the correct version? No, read what you wrote. Egric, Ampleton, Castle, walked up the stairs into the pits. See, and so he's missing the verb. He walked, he ambled to the gates. So actually what you did is you did two verbs, and the second verb has two prepositional phrases with it instead of three clauses. So if I put another verb... He walked, he ambled, he strolled. I've got three verbs and it's parallel. Do you see the difference? And so you don't have to agree with me. If you don't see the difference, it's okay to admit it. No, you see it. All right, anything else before I move on? Any other paper things? All right, we're gonna, we're gonna work on another one on a topic that we're gonna discuss here in a minute. We're gonna do two paragraphs. Does everybody know that we're not meeting next week? Next week is our break week. So, so any, no, this was, this was the next thing I was going to tell you. I have been known to give double work, but I, I plan my lessons before I know when they're going to take their breaks. So unfortunately, or fortunately for you, I can't plan double ahead. So no, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you assignment, but it's going to be the same amount I would normally give you for a week. So you're welcome. Um, Go ahead and open your reading questions to page 19, please. Really? Okay. I am, I am so glad we're going to go over them together. That's okay. Um, so last... Okay. Well, we're going to answer them all. So if you couldn't find them, but could you guys... Just stop talking. Just, I know we're, see, you claimed you were tired, but yet you're not too tired to talk. <laughs> okay. I have some things to show you, so we're going to get lively here in a little bit. Last week, we zoomed in on England, right? And we talked about the fact that there were British people living in England, and they're the people who built Stonehenge and had Druid priests. And then the Romans conquered them. And then the Romans had problems of their own and they had to leave to defend their empire and left the Britons on their own. And then the Angles and the Saxons came in and said, you people are an easy target. We like your island. We're taking it for ours. And they did. And so for a while, these Angles and Saxons, for a couple hundred years, these Angles and Saxons lived together with the Britons, not very happily, I am sad to report. Um, but... Britain became Angleland, England. But that's not where the story stop, stops. And this is what you read this week. So two weeks ago, hey, did anybody ever play Nevitoffel, by the way? Oh, I only I made it. Did you win? Yes. Yeah, awesome. 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 Yes. I made it, but I haven't played it yet. I laminated it. You're very fancy. Bentley. Oh, that sounds like an excuse. <laughs> okay. 
All right, come back to me, guys. So those Nebatafel players, those Vikings, swooped in on England too. They weren't going to leave England alone. And um, I'm going to I'm going to ask the questions not in the order that I wrote them on the paper. Okay, just I'm going to go to the second question. The Vikings started invading, and what? Great, and I put great in quotes because it's a hint, great English king spent much of his life fighting the Norsemen back from England. Nathan, Nathan raised his hand first, I feel Harold like. The great. No, not Harold. Harold, the, Harold doesn't get to be the great. Neither of them is the great. Wow. It's the only guy who's the great in your reading. There was a great. Alfred the Great, the top of page 108. In the south, the most important Saxon kingdom was that of Wessex. In 871, a young king came to the throne, Alfred, known in history as Alfred the Great. Why is that before the first century? Well, you know why? Because in chapter 7, they start talking about Alfred a lot more again. So I asked you more questions about Alfred because this is why I put those two sections of this book together, Oren. You know, you said, why are we skipping a section? This is why, because the two sections overlap each other. Um, <laughs> uh, Alfred the Great. So what, uh, and the second part of this question is, what, what was his character like? What kind of guy was Alfred? Why does he get to be the great? Why isn't he just the okay? What do you think, Nathan? He was very weak. But he had a heart for his kingdom. Okay, so so what, by weak and feeble, what do you mean? He did not have a war in his body. Quote, unquote, in his body. Okay, so physically, he's not the warrior specimen type, but had a heart for his people. What did he do for his people? Well, does anybody else other than Nathan want to say? No. Okay, Nathan, it's all yours. He built some schools and some other stuff and made an order of government. You don't sound like any of that is very exciting because you're tired. I think it's very exciting. Alfred had an older brother who, you know, older brother gets to be king before me because of the older brother thing, passing down the kingship. Um, and his older brother was, was fine. But even when they were little boys, they were different. His older brother, uh, heart of a warrior, I don't know. His older brother was very religious. In fact, once they were, and that's not a bad thing, but sometimes you have to know when. There are certain things you should do at certain times, and there are other things you should do at certain times. And when we mix them up, it causes problems. One time they were getting ready for a battle, and his brother just went to go to church. I know. Thank you, Jaden. I, I feel like going to church is a really, really good thing. But your, your soldiers are waiting. And finally, his brother Alfred just had to do it without him. Like he's not coming. He, he's not coming back from church, so he wasn't always the best planner of when he should do certain things. And then he died, so le leaving everything to Alfred. But back to when they were little boys, there's a famous story, and Dorothy Mills tells it that um, their mom had a book. Now that doesn't sound very special to you guys because you got lots of books. They didn't have very many books back then, you know, because all books are copied out by hand. They're expensive. Even if you're the king's family, they're expensive. And she held it up, and it's beautifully illustrated. And she says, I'll give this book to whichever one of you can read it to me first. And Alfred said, are you serious? You will give me that book for my very own if I can read it? Yes. He went off. He had a tutor. Worked this tutor. Worked, worked, worked to learn how to read. Came, read the book to his mom. Mom gave him the book. It's yours, Alfred. He always loved to learn. And so Nathan mentioned when he got to be king and he dealt with the Vikings, the Norsemen, he started all sorts of schools. He translated tons of books into Anglo-Saxon so his people could read them. Famous uh, Latin and Greek works. He sat down and translated them himself. He didn't just pay someone to do it. He did it himself because he loved learning. As a little boy, he went to Rome a few times with his dad and brought back books. I don't know. Do you guys, is that your cho souvenir of choice when you travel? You bring back books? I, I will admit I do bring back books sometimes. 
Okay. Well, Alfred chose books for his souvenir from Rome. So the Vikings invade. His brother dies. It is not going well. I mean, so not going well for Alfred that he disbands his army and they just go hide. You know, a bunch of people in one place are easy to find, but a lot of people just here and there in twos and threes, they're hard to find. So they scattered. Alfred went off and he lived in a swamp. What? He lived on an island in a swamp and frankly, no one knew he was King Alfred. <laughs> and the most famous story about Alfred is this. He's staying with a peasant woman in her hut, okay? And she thinks he's just a homeless man. She does not know he's the king. Because, you know, there's no photographs back then or video. You don't know what someone looks like. And so she thought he was just some guy. And she said, okay, here, I'm busy. Uh, cakes, little cakes of bread on the fire. Watch them, turn them, don't let them burn. This is one, one job, Alfred. Oh, yeah. So she goes off and does her... I don't know, feeds the chickens, works in the field, whatever. And they say Alfred is so distracted because he's trying to think of how to save England. What is going to be my plan of attack? How can I build my army back up and get us together so that we can get rid of these Vikings? Of course, he lets them burn because he's thinking of how to save his country. And the, the peasant woman comes back and she is really ticked. She is not happy. <laughs> You had one job, you had one job. You are incompetent. And she beat him on the head with her broom. He's the king. And here's the thing about Alfred, he doesn't tell her. He, he doesn't tell her, lady, you have no idea who you're hitting over the head with a broom. You are in big trouble. He just lets it go. He just, he just lets it go. Um, Alfred built up a navy. Did, was it one? No, I think it was on Tuesday. Somebody asked when England had boats, if they had a fleet. Alfred did that. How do Vikings travel? By boat. And so if I'm going to fight boat people, sailors, I need, I need a navy. Alfred built it up. So this is why Alfred is referred to as the Great. Um, we have, I'm going to walk around with this picture. A, it's called the Alfred Jewel. And we call it that because it says, Alfred had me made. And it's gold with precious gems. It's, okay, it's a picture of a person, but it looks a little funny. I'm just going to make you laugh, but it's okay. Uh, but if it looks gold and precious jewels, it is. And this is in a museum in England now. And it is very probably Alfred the Great's. Probably a pin, you know, that you would pin onto your cloak or something. Yes. I don't know. I'm sure somewhere it tells me how big it is. I am not sure how big it is. It, it is a weird looking guy. I, I'm totally with you there. <laughs> you know, I feel like if you asked me to make a guy out of gold and precious jewels, it wouldn't look very good either. So. Five nights at Freddy's slash a potato and a it looks sad. How does yeah. she look like Five Nights at Freddy's? I don't, I don't think that's a she. And that's I not a really. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. What does that have anything to do with Five Nights at Freddy's? Yeah, the head is as problematic. Although. The nose is one whole. Yes. Maybe if we saw it in person, it would be not as odd looking. Okay. Oh, all right. So Alfred, great though he was, had a strategy that a lot of people didn't like very much. He paid them finally. He, he paid the Vikings. Well, because they wanted to fight them. They wanted to, it's sort of low, uh, mm, it sounds cowardly to pay someone off. You know what I mean? Instead of fight them back in battle. You see what I mean? And But he paid them off. And he gave them, the eastern half of the island. He just gave it to them. They called it the Dane Law because these guys were Danish, right? Scandinavian, and they were in charge there. So it was the, the Dane Law. This worked for a while. This worked for a while until there was a king. And uh, in, 
in your book, Dorothy Mills calls him Ethelred the Readless. Like, readless. Um, read means law, rule. It can also mean um, uh, uh, organization. In other words, Ethelred is completely disorganized and doesn't follow any known laws. In most history books, they call him Ethelred the Unready. But unready isn't really the same as readless. Um, be that as it may, Ethelred got a bright idea. I'm going to kill all the Danes in England. Just on a given day, we're just going to massacre all of them and get rid of them. They've got family back home. What? The family did not take this sitting down. And Dorothy Mills tells us that after he suddenly gave orders for a general massacre of all the Danes settled in England, Swift was the vengeance of Swen, the king of the Danes. He descended on the coast of England, ravaged the land, and with slaughter and burning, avenged the massacre of his people. In 1014, he died and was succeeded by his son, Canute. Now, here, now we'll go to the first question. What is strange or notable about Canute becoming king of England? Yes, this is a, this is true. What country is Canute from? Is Canute British? Is he an Anglo or a Saxon? Where? What? What is he? He's Danish. What? The King of England, as. As Oren said, they were sharing the rule. The Anglo-Saxon king dies. Canute is number one. Canute isn't even English. How do you think the English people feel when Canute becomes king? How, how would you like it? This is not really the same for us, and the, the Constitution forbids this, but we'll, we'll imagine. If, if um, a, a Frenchman... Like somebody born, raised in France, always lived in France, and only speaks French, suddenly was the president of the United States. I know. That's why I said we have to use our imaginations here. I don't think we would like it. We, we want our ruler to be one of us because we feel like he will understand us better. And we can't understand him. This is how the people felt when Canute took over. Now, the Danes are in charge. And I want you to go, do, do you have, some of your books aren't like mine, but on page 106 of mine, there's a family tree. Does your book have a family tree like that? Can you find it? Can everybody find the family tree? Like I said, it's page 106 of this book. If you have your book with you, find the family tree. Okay. It's, it's right in chapter six. This is an important family tree and it explains tons of history. All right. At the top of the family tree is, okay, or 109. Rollo. Anybody remember who Rollo was? Yeah, the first duke. First duke of Normandy. What was he before? He was a Viking. He was pillaging France. And they said, buddy, if we give you some land and make you a duke, will you stop? And he said, okay, that sounds good. So that was Rollo. Now, look down, look down the family tree, if you've got it in front of you. His son, his grandson, his great-grandchildren, Richard the Good and Emma. Look who Emma married. Ethelred first. And then, after he was dead, Canute. Canute <laughs> married. Canute married the former wife of the English king and the granddaughter of a Viking, hoping that this would make people accept him more. It didn't. It didn't. Things just got worse and worse in England, and. We'll skip, we'll skip over a couple of generations here. But there, you, somebody was mentioning Harold. So we wanted Harold to be the great, all right. There was a guy named William, uh, uh, William Godwin. 
And uh, Mr. Godwin was the mover and shaker behind the throne. The descendants of Canute and Emma, finally they got the Angles and the Saxons to come back and get them back on the throne and booted out the Norsemen. But it was Godwin who was really, really the guy. He was, he was the kingmaker and the kingbreaker. And he had a son named Harold. Harold Godwin's son, right? The son of Godwin, Godwin's son. And, and once Harold was sailing in the English Channel, nobody knows why. Nobody knows if he was headed to France or he was just sailing and got blown by a storm. He got shipwrecked on the coast of France. It was, it was the coast of France where the Dukes of Normandy live. In this case, the Duke of Normandy is William. He's at the bottom of that family tree. He is Emma's grandson. Oh, you possibly, but it, it, the plot thickens. Um. This is William the Conqueror, who became William the First of England. But that's where. Let, hold on to that thought. Can we go back to that question in a little bit, Oren? Hold on to it. Harold is on the coast of France, where William is the Duke of Normandy, and he does not kill Harold. He says, "Oh, bummer." Actually, they some of his men do capture him and bring him before the king. It's like, "Oh no, no, Harold, we're cool, we're cool." You know, we're sort of related. Yeah, the, the English are related to me through Grandma Emma, you know. So they hung out for a while. They went hunting and fishing. William showed Harold a good time. But all the time, William has a plan. By the way, I am telling you the French, I'm telling you William's version, because it's the only version we know. Go ahead. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Great Aunt Emma. Thank you. Not important, though. It, his relative. Harold and William are hanging out. And then one day, Harold and William are having dinner. And William says, you know, <clears throat> uh, I have a really, really good claim to the throne of England. When the current king dies... I should be king, really. I should be next in line because I have family connections. And he said, Harold, you're, you and your dad, Godwin, are in a position to make and break kings. I want you to promise me that you'll make me king. And, and Harold, uh, okay, well, what are you going to do? You're stuck in France. You need William's help. You're going to say yes. And he says, come over here and lay your hand, lay your hand on this holy book and swear. And Harold, I swear. And then William moves the book and he's sworn on relics of saints that are under the, hidden under the book. He's sworn on the relics of the saints that, yes, William, you will be the next king of England. Great. Yes, Warren. Probably, although sometimes they just say on a table. The stories aren't all the same, so I'm I'm slightly embellishing. Sometimes books, sometimes a table with relics. Yes. Harold goes home, and within the next couple of years, the king dies. No, he was he was fairly old. It was it was it wasn't actually too suspicious, and and drum roll. They meet to pick a new king. It's not, his... it's not William. It's Harold. Uh. Burn. It's Harold. They make Harold Godwinson the new king of England. Okay, William's out, I don't know, hunting with his peeps, and he gets the news. He's going to pay. And William starts getting a fleet together. All right? And they, mm, I need a marker. Um, there, you know, this is, I'm not good at maps. All right. So this is the coast of England and this is France. All right. Why? This is not a good marker at all. Did I pick the same one? Okay. All right. So here are the, here are the boats, you know, they're ready here. I need, I need England to go up farther. Um, okay. Much farther, but I can't reach that high. Now, funny thing about sailing long ago, you have to wait until the wind has turned the right direction. 
There's no, um, you know, today we tack against the wind. So you can adjust the sails to catch just amount of wind that you can actually sail into the wind if you're a good sailor. But they didn't do that. They had to wait. And the English Channel is really finicky on which direction the wind is blowing. So, okay, William is waiting. As soon as I get my wind, by golly, Harold's going to pay. Harold knows it. So he's got guys stationed down here on the coast looking, looking for William's fleet. He's got soldiers there. Okay. No. Okay, but the, the plot is going to thicken in a minute. Yes. Because he wanted to be king, Micah. <laughs> uh, you know what, Micah? It probably was. And he probably would have lived a lot longer if he had done that. But maybe he had reasons. Uh, maybe he thought he was better for his people than William would be. Okay. There's another Harold. I'm sorry, but there's another Harold. His name's Harold Hadrada. And he is Swedish. And he... Um, also had a claim to the throne. He had lived in England for a while and then uh, got banished, sailed back to Scandinavia and got an army together to come take England. Guess when? The same summer. The same summer that William wants to attack, Harold Hadrada wants to attack. Harold Godwinson is sitting down here waiting for William and suddenly he gets news. And they're waiting all, su they're waiting all summer. Because the wind never is right. They're waiting. They're waiting. It's like, well, maybe he's not going to come. I'm sitting here, and suddenly I hear that way up at the top of the whiteboard, Harold Hadrada has landed. Harold Hadrada has landed with a whole army up there. Oh, so Harold Godwinson gets his guys together. He's like, okay, William's not coming. This guy is. Let's run for it. They march. They march all night straight up the island, meet Harold Hadrada at a place called Stamford Bridge, the Battle of Stamford Bridge, annihilate him, annihilate him. Harold Hadrada obliterated his whole army, gone. And of course, Harold Godwins is feeling pretty good. He's like, yeah, we got it. William did come. I took out Harold Hadrada. Everything's awesome. And we're having a party. And then a messenger comes in and says, yeah, William just landed. The wind changed while Harold marched north. Oh, are you kidding me? So they're tired. They just fought a battle. And, they, and now they're going to march back because William has finally shown up. William shows up and he sets up his camp near a, a town called Hastings in the year 1066. If you're going to learn a few history years, 1066 is a good one to learn. And Harold went out and he gave it his best shot. He didn't go out right away. He's probably tired. He's probably scared. He probably, you know, do you ever make up your mind that something's going to be a certain way and then suddenly it changes? And it sort of makes you, yeah, what? What? Now I have to adjust all my plans? Harold had decided William's not coming. And then William came. And he had to suddenly change his mind. So finally, when they went out, Harold wasn't really feeling it, if you know what I mean. He was already a little nervous. He was tired. He wasn't on his game. But there was another reason to, but let Warren make his comment before I say, tell you the other reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, William the Conqueror's dad. Uh, Those are the rule. There's the years they ruled, not the rules they lived. That's a really good question. Because often, often when you see king lists and the and the years are super short, it means the years they ruled, not the years they lived. Okay, good question. Okay, William did one more thing to clinch his victory, and it is this: he sent a message to the Pope before he left France, before he left Normandy, and he said, "Harold swore." Harold swore on relics. He is reneging on his promise, his holy promise, may I add. And Pope, would you please back me in this fight? Pope's like, yeah, you, you, you should be king of England. He promised. And so 
William was given the Pope's standard, like the banner of the Pope to carry into battle. So we don't know, this is speculation, but a lot of people think that when Harold saw the Pope's flag and realized the church was on William's side and not his, it was very demoralizing. You know, he's just, oh my gosh, it's over. It's done, I'm done for, I'm done for. Even, even God is against me. And maybe didn't fight as well as he could have or should have. Well, William did not come alone, Oren. William had an entire fleet full of soldiers and they were all itching to get their hands on England because think about it. If I am a servant of the new king, if I am friends with the new king, there are going to be perks in it for me, right? If we're all William's court and we go take over England and now he's Duke of Normandy and King of England, yay for us. It means treasure. It means honor. We want William to win. We'll fight for it. Unless you die. This is the gamble that soldiers take, Oren. When you go take over another country, the, you don't want to die because that ruins the whole plan. The battle went against Harold. And legend has it, for reasons I will tell you in a minute, that he got shot in the eye with an arrow. See that? That's, <laughs> and that's the sound. That's the sound that, no. Um, William took over. Okay, so now I'm sorry. I've ruined your questions like I always do. What catastrophic event happened to England in 1066? The Battle of Hastings. This is how this is known to history, even though it wasn't in the town of Hastings. And who were the ancestors of William I? William I of England. Rollo the Viking. He's a Viking. And the Vikings have swooped back in and taken over England. And they're going to stay now. Now, I want to show you something really cool about the Battle of Hastings. But before I do, I want to ask you to use your imagination. You are the Duke of Normandy. You got it? You, you're in mine? And so who's above you in the chain? Like, who do you think is above a duke? The king. The king of France is above you. You owe allegiance to the king of France because you're the Duke of Normandy. But now you're the king of England. Do you owe allegiance to anyone if you're the king of England? No, because you're at the top. So this is going to be a problem that we're going to talk about the rest of this fall. I'm king of England, and I don't really owe anybody any answers. But I'm also the Duke of Normandy. And unfortunately, that means I owe allegiance to the king of France. It's a problem. Because if the King of France tells me to do something, do I do it? Is he telling me to do it because I'm the Duke of Normandy or I'm the King of England? Maybe the Duke of Normandy should obey. The King of England doesn't have to obey. Do you see the problem? This is going to be William's descendants. This is going to be their problem. And so in a few months, we're going to talk about massive war between England and France. And, and this gives you a little peek at why England and France are always fighting with each other. Yes. I don't want to stop, Warren. I've got lands and vassals. I've got people. I've got castles. I've got power. I want, I want them both, Warren. I'm greedy. I want them both. I just want more. I don't want less of anything. And I, I worked for it, Warren. I worked for it. I didn't really work to be Duke of Normandy because it got given to me when I was born. But I worked for the King of England gig. He didn't. And you know what, Oren? It's so, here's the cool thing about history. If somebody had just made a different decision, if Harold had turned over England, if William had renounced the dukedom of Normandy, like all of history, all of history, is a sort of English, European history would have been different. Maybe not, maybe not in the way, if, if English history, since our, even if you are not English genetically, you are English culturally. You know, America was an English colony, right? That's, that's who we are. And so, yeah, maybe our history would also be different. Maybe we would be different. One little decision, those aren't little decisions, but you know what I mean. One decision.
could change, change the path. It's fascinating. Okay, so I told you that the story I was telling you was William's version. Obviously, Harold's version did not involve swearing on relics or promising anything to anyone. Or if he did, he was under what we would say duress. He was being forced to do it. Because, you know, I'm sort of captive in William's court when I got shipwrecked. But William's version is the one that went down in history, is the one we all know about. And it is because William had a relative who was a bishop in a monastery uh, at a cathedral in France. And he commissioned an embroidery to be made. Um, they call it a tapestry. A tapestry is when you actually weave the threads together and make a picture. But, you know, embroidery is when you have a cloth, you know, and you sew in it like a cross stitch or this sort of thing. It's really an embroidery. It's not a woven tapestry, but they still call it the tapestry. And it's called the Bayou Tapestry because uh, Bayou, France was where it was uh, made and kept for a long time. And it's an embroidery of the entire story of how Harold went to France and he swore to William and then William heard that the king had died. The whole story, all the way down to Harold being shot in the eye with an arrow. This is why we think that's how he went out because there's a picture of Harold and, and it says in, in Harold Rex Interfectus Est. Harold the king is killed. Um, okay, so I don't know how we're gonna do this, but um, okay, I'm gonna get in the middle and you guys are gonna stand up. Um, I have this amazing book that I bought for like 50 cents at a library book sale, and then it had the entire Bayou Tapestry in it. It has the whole, okay, so just like stand up so you can just see, okay? It's the coolest, it's the coolest thing ever. So, okay, so here, I'm going to do this, and then the people on the video are just going to have to, all right, I don't, even if I lay down, you guys can't see. Okay, I'm trying to be low. Um, so it starts here. And see, it's it's a long strip. In the room where it's displayed, it's a pretty big room, and it just goes around the entire room. They've got it behind glass. How would you tell and, where this started then? Well, it's got uh, um, Latin narration. Oh, you mean in the room? There's probably a sign that says start here. Um, so it's, it's embroidered with the entire story um, of how, you see, he goes and he's in France and he's hunting with Harold. I know, I know. I know. I, I'm I'm sorry, but if you get a general idea of the fact that this thing even exists, that's good enough. But let me find. Okay. The, here, the horses are getting out of the boats. The the tapestry. Um, it was made just like in in William and Odo. Odo is the bishop's lifetime. So it's it's a thousand years old, which is cool. Oh, this book, I don't know, um, thirty or forty years old. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here, Harold. Okay, Harold Rex Interfectus Est, and he's right here. I'll bring this. And he's got. Actually, I'm going to give you this picture in a minute. He's holding an arrow, and it's sticking out of his eye. Yeah. There's body parts everywhere. Yeah, you can come. You can come see if you want. Yeah, who, that that always brings them in when I say there are body parts everywhere. That that's when we all crawl under the table. I, I see this so famously. Yes, like yes. So it says Harold Rex Interfectus Est. Harold is killed. Um, right here. Where is his eyeball? Being shot out. Oh, um, and I'm going to give you that. So, so the entire, so this is obviously the battle, but the rest of it tells the entire story from the beginning. So it starts off, King Edward, where Harold, Duke of the English, and his soldiers ride to Bosham and the church, and Harold has sailed the sea. Um, okay. I will lay this out, and if you got, if we have time at the end and you want to look through it, it's cool. Or look online. I bet there's a website that has the whole thing. You can probably scroll through. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, except, and so this is a big embroidered cloth. What this is is a big strip of embroidered cloth, and it tells the entire story of one of the most famous battles of history, honestly, because suddenly England changed management, changed hands and it changed English history forever. Um, and 
conveniently provides us with the thing we're going to write about over break. I told you I was going to give you a picture of Harold being shot in the eye, or so you can frame it or whatever. Um, I have a two pages on the Bayou Tapestry, and we are going to make an outline together of the first paragraph you're going to write. You're going to do an outline of the second paragraph and then write the paper for me. No. Okay. I'm, I have confidence in you, Jaden. It's good. It's good. You can do it. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Last time I miscounted. We are going to make two paragraphs. Seriously, seriously, calm down. What? Yes, please take one and pass it down. Yes. Mm. We don't really know much, but apparently he denied everything. He denied, no, I did not swear. I did not promise. And here's, in addition, he said it wasn't his promise to make. Kings were made by a council. It wasn't um, automatically always passed to the eldest son at that point. And so a council got together to decide who should be king. Yes, that's exactly. That's the council. And so, you know, his defense is you asked me to, to promise something that was not in my power to give. So my promise is null and void. Um, William didn't care. Mm. I'm trying to remember the title. It was on the King Shadow. Mm. So good. Just no, I haven't read that. And um, and it would portrayed a Harold that was very um, had amazing character. Mm. And so I don't know how accurate that is. Like at mm. the end of it, I'm like, man, I love Harold. Um, but, yeah. That, no, I've not. It sounds great. Uh, there was a book that tells the story in very uh uh. It's a history book, but it's very conversational, and it's not. It's it's very accessible for any age. It's it's called Ten Sixty Six Something that has a subject I can't remember. So if anybody's really into this, like I want to know the whole story about Harold Hadrada and everything, ask me, and I will I will send you the book, um, the title and the author, but I can't I can't remember what it was. Yeah, Oren. Uh, I don't know. I think so. I will look and you ask me the second question while I look. Well, you, you know what? That's what we're about to do together, Oren. So you need to hold on. Yes, you did give me your paper. Could everybody turn to page 20 in your reading guide? It is empty, but not for long. <laughs> Oh, okay. And I just feel like, I feel like I threw my marker in and then pulled out the same bad marker. No, this is, you're done. Okay, could you please write this on that page? We'll put five here and then put a two. Everybody put that on your empty page. Is somebody, Orin, are you lacking a writing instrument? Can someone, does someone have a spare writing instrument? I have a pen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You know what? They, you, are you familiar with the phrase, beggars can't be choosers? <laughs> I'm just really mean today. I'm just very mean today. It means if you need something, you can't complain about what you're given. You have to just use it. That's what that means. Oh, well, lucky you. Okay. So you guys just gave me a paper with one paragraph on the Sutton Who burial. 
And every sentence in your paragraph was about the Sutton Who burial. This is a very big topic and we could go on and on. We could have written a whole paper on it, but we didn't have a much sor enough source material. When we write a paragraph, a nonfiction paragraph, it is all about one topic. So if I'm going to write a paragraph about kangaroos, and I suddenly want to start telling you about the geography of Australia. This does not belong. Well, that kind of, that's okay. It does not belong. Well, I can say kangaroos live in Australia, but going on to tell you, you know, about the what the the right. building in Sydney, the what's it called? You know, no, don't tell me about that because that's not about kangaroos. Now, follow this. What if I'm doing two paragraphs about kangaroos? What are some things about kangaroos I could write about? Tell me something. Okay, where they live. Okay, how they live. How they live. And um, like what food they eat. Okay. And um, like why they have a pouch. Okay, that why they have a pouch might be very specific. We get their appearance. Or their Maybe. autonomy. What does that mean? The, their anatomy, right? And, and they may be autonomous, which means they rule themselves, but they also have anatomy. Um, so, so let me rerun run through that, except Nathan's got another one. We could. And what, what topic, Nathan, shh, guys, what topic would that fall under? Talking about their babies. Could we, could we name that topic? What? Well, children. children, families, kangaroo families, that could be a topic. We could talk about do the, do the moms and dads stay together always? Do they, how long do they raise their babies? That could be families. We could talk about what do they eat? Where do they live? What do they look like? What are their families like? And each of those would be a topic. Does everybody follow me? It would be, it would be four paragraphs. But if I'm writing about what they eat, I'm probably not going to suddenly start talking about, um, you know, their big feet. Well, red pandas would be a completely different paper, I feel like, Jonathan. <laughs> Maybe. So when we choose paragraphs, we're choosing topics. Now, I just told you two things. We're going to write about the biotapestry, and we have two paragraphs. How many topics are we going to have? Two. Two separate things. And everything that I write about in this paragraph is going to be about this topic. And everything I write in this paragraph is going to be about this topic. Now, this is going to be super easy because, A, I just gave you one sheet of paper and we're very limited. So I'm basically going to give you the topics. Topic number one, write this down. The Battle of Hastings. Topic number two, the Bayou Tapestry. Uh, oh, can you see this in the back? Am I writing big enough? B-A-Y-E-U-X. Don't you love the French? <laughs> do I need, seriously, do I need to write bigger for you guys? No. Okay. Yes, Oren. So the first topic is about the second battle is about the It is. It tells the story. Exactly. Because that's what our paper tells us about. E U X. Bayou. <laughs> um, Zachary, may I have your paper? Um, this because I don't have one. And can you look on with Caleb? And then I'll give it back. It's totally fine. It, no, no, doodles are just completely acceptable. Okay. All right. Here's what I want to do. Look at the front of the paper I gave you. You know the front because it says the Bayou Tapestry at the top. Has everybody got that side? Awesome. I am now going to write down things on my outline about the battle. How am I going to choose what to pick? Yes, interesting or important. 
If it seems really important that my reader know this, I better write it down. If I just think it's way cool, I write it down. When I get at least five points, I'm done. I don't care anymore. I'm done. Then don't don't include that. Unless kangaroos were pivotal in the battle. I don't think I remember reading about that, but I do understand they can kick you really hard and do some damage. So maybe this maybe this should be developed, like kangaroo warfare. I don't know. Seems like there's an opening in the world for that. Okay. I am going to now start reading, and you're going to tell me if it's interesting or important. The, Bayou the famous Bayou Tapestry is an exciting account in pictures and in words of the events that led to the successful Norman invasion of England in 1066. It's a long sentence. All right. Jonathan, you would that go under the battle or the tapestry? I think it sort of would go, because tapestry is, so if you like that, Jonathan likes it. How could we say that in three words, Jonathan? Sum up what I that first sentence. The famous Bayou Tapestry is an exciting account in pictures and in words of the events that led to the successful Norman invasion of England in 1066. And it's the first page on the paper that I gave you, or first sentence. It's a lot of words. It's the first sentence. <laughs> Oh, I'm on the That's why I said. <laughs> I should have passed. Tapestry. Pictures. 1066. Okay. Do, do I have to, if I'm putting it under tapestry, do I have to use the word tapestry again, you think? Because tapestry is my, probably could say that. So pictures, Norman invasion maybe. And 1066 could be free because it's a number. Yeah. Nor Pictures, Norman Invasion, 1066. Okay, if you like that or you think it's important, go for it. And some of you are like, eh, I don't care. But if you like it, remember, what is interesting is a little bit up to you, if you see what I mean. And sometimes what is important is a judgment call, too. All right, I'm going to move on. It begins, oh, Edward Rex, ubi Harold dux anglorum, et sui milites equitant ad basham. Uh, this text in Latin provides the caption for the picture story. It means, Edward the King, where Harold, Duke of the English, and his soldiers ride to Basham. All right, I'm just going to tell you flat out, I don't think that's interesting or important, and we're skipping it. All right. Next section, Harold and William. When Edward, King of England, died in 1066, there were two powerful leaders who claimed the throne, Harold and William, Duke of Normandy. That seems pretty important because why are they fighting? Why is there even a battle? So how can we say that in three words, that two guys, two guys want William and Harold claim throne? That's, that's still... Four words, no, even. No, no, no. Oh, like, oh like this. what are you drawing a throne? No, no, no. Oh no, but William and Harold claim throne. Uh, what would be, uh, I'm not sure. Um. To, oh, I've got an idea. What if we? What if? What if we take two lines? We can take two lines. Two. Possibly, but let's let's hold it. How about two claim? English throne. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe we can talk about who they are in addition to more uh, information. And we can put their names in later. I think I'm going to put uh, Harold and William and some more. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. You know what? That's good too. That's good. What Or did everybody hear what Orrin said? He said, Harold. And symbol William claim draw crown. Unfortunately, my version tells you which crown, but we're not going to be too picky here. I think we know it's England. All right. At the beginning of the tapestry, we learn that Harold traveled to Normandy and swore to support William. Interesting. Okay. Harold. 
Harold swore. What did he swear? Um, can I use Orin's crown again? Maybe Harold swore William King. Does that make sense? Why is there a I I guess because I was thinking, what did Harold swear? Okay, that's fine. Remember, guys, there's not one right way to do this. There's there's not as good ways. Picking words like the and but is not going to help you remember anything that's going on in the story. But other than that, you got a lot of leeway here. That's, that's true, sometimes. But as soon as Edward died, Harold claimed the English throne. William prepared for invasion and war. So Harold, can we can we just really abuse this crown symbol a lot here? Yes. Yeah. Harold King, and what does William do? Angry. All right, William angry. I think that the understatement of the day, at the le very least. Now, Oren brought up something. We're running a little, you know, if we wanted to keep it to sort of like five points, we're going to have to cut to the chase. Or we could add a couple more points if we, if we run short. We have control. We don't have to do it this way just because that's the number of uh, points I made. He built a great fleet and on September 28th sailed to Pevensey in Sussex on the south coast of England. What do you think? If he's going to invade, doesn't he have to sail there? Yeah. Yeah. Could we? Could, could, like, we probably know that he. Like a ship. Oh, ship. I mean, you can do it all in arrow. symbols, so we can save a line. You, you draw like an easy ship, a dash, and then an English flag. Why don't Why don't we read the next sentence and see if we even need to say that he sailed there? Because if he's going to start fighting there, apparently he got there. If you follow my meaning, does that make sense to you guys? He didn't just teleport. Um, they did not. We, I wish we did. Okay. The Normans landed their army, horses, and supplies, and then built a timber and earth castle at Hastings. Well, it is a castle made of timber and earth. In other words, it's not rock, and it's not only dirt. It's not only wood, because that takes a long time. I fill in the gaps with dirt. It's basically a big dirt hill with some wood framing. Meanwhile, Harold hurried south after defeating King Harold of Norway near York. That whole Harold Hadrada thing kind of draws out the story a lot. Maybe we don't have time for that. Let's look at the back. This one actually says the Battle of Hastings. I feel like this is going to be good. William had an army of about 7,000, including 2,000 cavalrymen. The English army was smaller, but fought at a place later called Battle. That's very creative. Um, do we think it's interesting or important that William's army was much bigger? Yes. It might have turned the tide of the battle. I, I feel like I'm with Oren. I feel like it's important. William's army, bigger. And if I want. I could include it's 7,000 men, and if I'm really good at drawing horses, I could draw a little horse and 2,000 horse. I am not, and I'm not going to make you suffer through one of my four-legged mammals that looks like every other four-legged mammal I draw except for the length of the neck and the legs. No, on your paper, on your paper. Only for time constraints, Oren. Um, the tapestry gives all the gory detail of battle. The arrows and spears fly through the air and men are cut down. I showed you the body parts at the bottom of the tapestry. Finally, Harold is wounded and killed. Is this interesting or important? Yes. Oh, so Harold uh, and the English have a new king. Harold, uh, we can use dies as one of our words. We want another word? We could. 
I'm, I am not a super big fan of lots of drawings on these. I'm just going to tell you, because you might not understand it later. Harold dies. We could use it at, at, gorily, horribly. Harold, oh, oh, Harold impaled. Do we need to say he was impaled on an arrow, or do we want to say where he was impaled? <laughs> okay. Oh, that was the, that was the, <laughs> we were going to put his eye. Oh, you know what we could do? Oh, oh. No, we don't want to look back at the source text, if at all possible. You, if you are, it's just super smart, you can remember it in your brain. If you're like me, I got to write it down. It's kind of hard to forget after you hear about it, honestly. It's one of those things. Okay, now, do you see that the rest of the paper, it has a paragraph called Rediscovering the Tapestry, and it has captions. Do you see all the captions? You, the first thing you're going to do on this paper is you're going to sit down and you're going to pick interesting and important things about the tapestry and fill in the second paragraph from the paragraph and the captions. Does everybody understand? Yeah. Okay. And then after you pick what is interesting and important, you are going to turn it back into two paragraphs for me. If at all possible, not, oh, this is X, not looking at your paper again, not looking at the source text again. I want you to include both kinds of parallelism. Oh, there's all sorts of arrows flying. And I mean, it, I feel like battle gives a lot of phrases, clauses. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Lots of stuff happening in a battle. You know what? You can do more than one of each. There's no rule. You can do it in every, it might get a little tiresome, but. Oh. Um, but you can do more than one, but not, oh. I apologize for the intrusion. Oh. But it's like, I feel like if I don't do it. Right, oh, thank you. It. Thank you. Um, are there any questions about doing this paper? It's basically exactly what you just did, only with two paragraphs. So two topics, the battle and the tapestry. If you, hey, Oren, shh. If you are working on this and you can't remember the instructions or you're not sure what to do, email me or call me and say, I don't know what to do. What do I do now? And I will tell you, okay? Don't just wonder. Don't, don't fret. Yes. Um, your mother knows. So ask, ask your parents. Your parents get an email from me every week. Okay. Okay. And some of you are on the group. For next time that we meet, I want you to read Dorothy Mills chapter eight. Next chapter, and it's in your reading guide too, and answer the questions. Now, I want to move on to the children of Odin, but I need to, to apologize to you guys, okay? I did not realize that many of you had a different book. It's the same words. It's the same author. But this was the one I put on the Amazon list because, it, and maybe sometimes Amazon sends different things. So... I held it up and I said, if your book looks like mine, read pages 1 through 44. But a lot of you read pages 1 through 44 in that book, and it, it wasn't up to where I meant. And that's my fault, okay? I should have looked at your books. And so here's the thing. You didn't read as much as I was going to have you read. Oh, and your book looks different than mine too. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you what story to read through. This is much safer. And then no matter what page numbers you have, it will be fine. Also, if some of you read not as far as I meant you to, you've got two weeks now. So just catch up over break, and it's it's fine. Yes, Oren. Yes, that's why I told the rest of them that they didn't read as far. Um, may... Oh, here, I'll just write it over here. So here's where I want you to read through for next week, two weeks. I want you to read through, write this down, through the children of Loki. He is. 
Well, Loki, Loki, yes. Loki is a mixed bag. Loki's like, uh, it just depends on what side of the bed he got up that morning. Am I going to be nice? Am I going to be a jerk? Yes. So read through to the end of the story called The Children of Loki. And that will get you two thirds of the way through the book. We were going to read this book in three weeks. So that gives you two thirds of the way. So if you're a little bit behind, you know, it's fine. These stories are not hard to read. And frankly, I think they're kind of entertaining. We want to talk about some of them here in a minute. Okay. So Zach says that, may I hold up your book? If your book looks like this, it's through page 174. All right, so page 174. All right, the end of the story called The Children of Loki. Thank you. So these gods, do they seem happy all the time? Why not? Like never. Why? What's the problem? They're gods. But isn't that an awesome gig? Isn't it great to be a god? You're rich and you have everything you want and everything's always good? So, Oren, are you telling me that some of these gods are evil? Is our god ever evil? No. no. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would like be like to worship gods who can be jerks and mess with you and do evil things? You can't rely on them. You know, maybe maybe they'll be good to you today. Maybe not. I want you just to stop and imagine worshiping those gods. Those are your gods. It's a little bit depressing. They don't have anyone they can rely on. And you know what? The gods don't have anyone they can rely on. One of the very first, I think it's the second story, the building of the wall. So they're building... And Odin wants there to be a wall, and he hires this guy. Do you remember the story? Hired a guy, and the guy said, I can do it for you in a year, and then you have to give me anything I want. And like, okay, sure, got it. I feel like, A, you should ask first up front what the guy wants, um, but they didn't. B, maybe you should, you know, think about the consequences of your actions further down the road. They do not do this either. And they hire him. Yes, Zach. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, just say it if it comes. Yes, Oren. Maybe you should ask if he is a giant. <clears throat> because we don't like the giants. Yes. Why would the gods need a wall? Can God even die? And if they're the most powerful creatures, who's going to hurt them? Who is going to hurt them? Some giants? They, I mean, they made the giants. They are not the most powerful creatures. And you know what? It is unclear whether these gods made everything. It says in our far away and long ago, um, in those times the gods lived, Odin and Thor, Hodor and Balder, Tyr and Heimdall, as well as Loki, um, at that time, too, there were men and women in the world. It doesn't say they made the men and women. And it says that there are giants in the world. It doesn't say they made the giants. These gods are not the creator of everything. And this is a very astute observation. They need a wall. They need a wall to protect them because even the gods are not safe. Now, what the profession? What are the people who worship these gods? What are they basically known for? Yeah. Running around and killing people, right? We pillage and we loot. We found out that's not all they do. But they do, they do it. They live by fighting. Remember um, Beowulf. And he comes to help Rothgar in his hall at Hirat. And and what are they? A bunch of a bunch of warrior guys who have beer drinking parties every night and then pass out on the benches, quite frankly, until monsters eat them. Until Beowulf rips people, you know, rips monsters' arms out and nails it to the roof. 
And so, so they, they are a world of fighting and dying and their gods are a world of fighting and dying. Later on, this book is going to tell you, and maybe you know already, do you know what the warriors who die and go to Valhalla, do you know what they do all day? Uh-huh. They kill each other and they chop each other to pieces and then they pick up the pieces and put them all back together and then they party all night. And then they go do it again the next day. Okay. This is not my idea of heaven. And all they're doing is training for Ragnarok. And all they're doing is training for Ragnarok because these gods know something. Their world's going to end. They're not eternal. They're not eternal. So they start out, they build the wall, the wall that apparently they need. And how do they do it? They trick the giant out of his pay. They trick the giant out of its pay. And the end of that story says this. And the gods saw in their golden palaces behind the great wall and rejoiced that their city was now secure and that no enemy could ever enter it or overthrow it. But Odin, the father of the gods, as he sat upon his throne, was sad in his heart, sad that the gods had got their wall built by a trick, that oaths had been broken, and that a blow had been struck in injustice in Asgard. These are not justice. And Odin is the only one who says, rats, we've just founded our dynasty, our kingdom on cheating someone out of their pay by trickery. That's going to come back to bite us someday. Karma, indeed. We, some groups would call it karma. Um, Ragnarok is coming when everything comes crashing down. Oh, I, I mean, I'm just talking to you guys and it's depressing me. I can't even imagine that being my life. I get up and I look out the window in the morning and I drink whatever hot drink that Vikings drink in the morning and, and, and thought it's all coming crashing down and the gods can't save me. That's depressing. Yeah. That's all you can, that's all you can hope for. So you know what, Oren? If that's, if that's destiny, then let her rip. I will go out and just get killed in battle because at least I'll go out in a blaze of glory. And die again and again because that's fun, apparently. Um, Beowulf. I don't. I didn't bring my copy of the Beowulf that you guys read, but but he he says um, uh, that's as good as it gets for a human being to 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 be a warrior and leave a great name for yourself because it's all going down. So things, I, I'm not going to tell you, because some of you read some stories. I read some stories this week that you didn't read, you know, and I don't want to ruin all the stories for you, but I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, Odin gets hints that all is not well in the universe, in the world. He knows, he knows it's not going to be, but it's getting worse, and he decides to go seek wisdom. But I want to read this sentence to you, and I want to see what you think of it. He says to his wife, or his wife says, much has to be done in Midgard, the world of men. Odin answers, I would change what knowledge I have into wisdom so that the things that are to happen will be changed into the best that may be. First of all, Odin can't make everything the best, the best that may be, as good, as good as we can. We'll do as good as we can. But listen to what he said. I would change the knowledge I have into wisdom. What's the difference? What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom, Oren? Okay. Can you, can you think of an example? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. But... An example of having knowledge, but then having wisdom. Um, yeah, I always, I know Solomon asked for wisdom and he was given wisdom, but then he just didn't use it much when he got older. 
I to use an example. Let's use a really simple one. Knowledge is looking at the weather forecast and seeing that there is rain in the forecast. But wisdom is planning my day around that and bringing an umbrella, maybe in a rain slicker. You, you, using it, putting it into practice. That's, a, that's not a great example, but Odin has knowledge. He knows things. Things are going to crash and burn. But I need wisdom. What do I do about it? How do I act to make things as best as may be? Not 100% perfect. Um, okay, so um, I, you know what? Maybe next week. I told you, some of you were coming in. My daughter made a video of um, a Norse myth with, uh, it's set to music and it's got the runes that describe, you know, for father, mother, son, and a story that's not in here. So I would love, it's 10 minutes long and I'd love to show it to you guys, but I think that I'm probably not going to do it today. Be oh no. Hold on. Oh no, here it is. There was a book I needed because I want to do something else. Um, so remind me in two weeks, say, what about your daughter's video? All right. And we'll try to set aside 10 minutes. Um, Odin, Odin decides to go to a well where he can drink from the well and gain wisdom. I won't tell you more than that so that if you haven't read that story, you can enjoy it. But he runs into a giant. And the giant has an interesting habit. His name is Vaftrudner. I don't even know if that's close. Vaftrudner was indeed the wisest of the giants. And many went to strive to gain wisdom from him. But those who went to him had to answer the riddles. Vaftrudner asked. And if they failed to answer, the giant took their heads off. I feel like the back table did not hear that last little thing. What are we doing, Nathan? What does the giant do to you if you don't answer his riddle? Oh, you did listen. You are a better multitasker than I am. Yes. Cuts off your head. And so he meets Odin. And in the story, which I won't ruin for you if you haven't read it yet, uh, he just starts asking him random riddles that he thinks no one can answer because only Odin would know that. Odin is in disguise, you see. And so he doesn't know he's asking Odin. The reason I bring this story up is because the Anglo-Saxon people, the, the Scandinavian people, loved riddles, apparently. Not funny riddles. You know, our riddles are usually, when you tell the answer, it makes you laugh often. And these are riddles that are more um, brain twisters, you know, descriptions of things, and you're not totally sure what it is, and you have to think of it. There's a famous one, um, in a, it's in a book that we're going to read in the spring, um, Box, Box Without Hinges, Key or Lid. Inside gold and treasure is hid. And some of you may know what this is. Do you know what the box without hinges, key, or lid? Inside gold and treasure is hid. Oh, we don't know. I'm so happy. It is from The Hobbit. It is. And that's why I'm talking about this so much. It's an egg. Box without hinges, key or lid, but inside golden treasure is hid. I know, but Oren, you can't do riddles that way. You can't be Mr. Science and do riddles. You have to be poetic and metaphorical. Anyway, I brought some Anglo-Saxon riddles. These are thousand-year-old, fourteen-hundred-year-old riddles, written down on scraps of paper. Problem: we we don't know the answer. <laughs> They didn't write down the answer. So my book has projected possible answers. Um, I have marked the ones that I like best. And we don't have time for all of them. OK. All right. Let me start with this one because I like this one. OK. Are you ready? It's kind of long. My home is not silent. I myself am not loud. The Oren, Oren, please be quiet. You have to listen to the whole thing. 
My home is not silent. I myself am not loud. The Lord has provided for the pair of us a joint expedition. I am speedier than he and sometimes stronger. He stays the course better. Sometimes I rest, but he runs on. For as long as I live, I live in him. If we leave one another, it is I who must die. I'm going to read it one more time. I'm not, I mean, think about it. If you've got a conjecture, do it. But unfortunately, I have to let you go in seven minutes and we can't ponder. Okay. My home is not silent. I myself am not loud. The Lord has provided for the pair of us a joint expedition. I am speedier than he and sometimes stronger. He stays the course better. Sometimes I rest, but he runs on. For as long as I live, I live in him. If we leave one another, it is I who must die. She's a boat. Okay, there's two, there's two things. It says the I I and he, a joint expedition. So whatever the answer is, it's two things. If they separate, one of them will die, but the other one will be okay. If we separate, if we part, it is I who must die. What do you think it is? Oh, well, but but here's the thing. I am speedier than he and sometimes stronger. He stays the course better. What? He stays the course better than me. He keeps going. He follows through to the end better than I do. Stays the course. What? What? Uh, oh, but 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 if a guy in the boat leaves, will he die? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, we can't we can't add extra. What does what does Mrs. McAlpine think? Oh, I am some stronger, speedier. But the shadows never. One of them can't be speedier. Oh, that's you know. Here's the thing. We don't know that you're wrong. We don't know that you're wrong because they're suggested. Okay, here's their suggestion, and I like it. A fish in a river. I'm going to read it again, and now think fish in a river. My home is not silent. I myself am not loud. The Lord has provided for the pair of us a joint expedition. I, the fish, am speedier than he, sometimes stronger. He stays the course better. The river. Sometimes I rest, but he runs on. For as long as I live, I live in him. If we leave one another, it is I who must die. It fits, doesn't it? It fits. Uh, rivers are noisy. The uh, Many times rivers are noisy. Um, okay. Okay, this one's easy. I think this one's easy. It's very poetic, but it's very short. What, the wave over the wave, a weird thing I saw. Thorough wrought and wonderfully ornate. A wonder on the wave. Water become bone. What do you think water become bone? That's wonderfully ornate sometimes. It's a bone. Uh, what do you think? Oh, I didn't even think of that. That's awesome. Except there are no coral reefs in the in you know like Scandinavia. Okay, okay. What what water become bone? If I just said that, water become bone. Oh, oh, yeah. See, these are all good, but this is not what I was thinking. What do we call it when water gets hard like a bone? Ice. Maybe ice. Although I really dig the coral reef. I like the coral reef. Okay, okay. I have time for one more. Uh, maybe I'll bring this back and we can, like, if we have a few minutes at the end, we can do some of these. Okay, this one's hard. And you have to think, okay, I'm going to read it twice. And the second time, I'm going to act it out. <laughs> I saw four fine creatures traveling in company. Their tracks were dark, their trail very black. The bird that floats in the air swoops less swiftly than their leader. He dived beneath the wave. Drudgery was it for the fellow, 
that taught all four of them their ways on their ceaseless visits to the vessel of gold. All right, this is hard. All right, but, and you kind of, and some of it we don't understand. Okay, now I'm going to act it out. I saw four fine creatures traveling in company. Their, their tracks were dark. Their trail very black. The bird that floats in the air swoops, this is the bird, less swiftly than their leader, he dived beneath the wave. Drudgery it was for the fellow that taught all four of them their ways on their ceaseless visits to the vessel of gold. Oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Ceaseless visits to the vessel of gold. I'm writing, writing with a quill pen, the bird, and his ceaseless visits to the vessel of gold. All right. It's very, it's very fun. It's cool. Like I said, there are more, but we don't know. This is the killer. We don't know if those are the right answers. And sometimes like, I don't know what the four creek, what are the four? Like I get the dark tracks. Their tracks are dark. Ceaseless visits to the vessel of gold and the feather. Well, four. Why not? <laughs> um, okay. Have a nice break. Write a paper on the Battle of Hastings and the Bay Tapestry. Read chapter eight and read through the children of Loki. And uh, maybe make up a riddle if you want to and share it with us. A lot of it.